you go to Romans chapter number 5, and again, me and my wife's thanks for all the kindnesses shown, and uh, for uh, Pastor McGovern, once he found out this was the week of our anniversary, inviting us to be able to come up a few days early, and we've had a wonderful time, one of the best trips we've ever had, and uh, we enjoyed ourselves immensely. We come off of a busy, busy stretch. We're going to go home and hit a busy, busy stretch, say, how long is... That stretch been going on about 38 years. I keep thinking there's got to be a slow down spot somewhere. But man, alive, I, I just feel like the Lord's, I think he's got his hand on the door. And uh, how can you look around at all that we've seen the last couple years and not believe that Jesus Christ coming is very soon? And I believe that I'm preaching to the rapture generation. I, I really do. I, I know we can't set a date, but um, I will tell you what, I think... My dad taught me in, in Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Next thing on the uh, prophetic calendar, and we're looking forward to it. And I'm, I'm excited as I watch all of the signs of the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to be found busy. You know, one of the most discouraging, I think, parables is the parable of the ten virgins. Yeah, five had oil and five didn't, and thank God that the five had oil. But the Bible says that while the master uh, lingered, uh, they all slumbered and slept. They all slumbered and slept. And boy, that haunts me, preacher. I thought, I don't want to be one of those Christians that are asleep when the Lord comes back. I want to be up at it doing. And so I, I appreciate being in a place that shares that with me. Acts, or Romans chapter number 5 Verse 1, the Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're saved, as I read these verses, that will cause you to rejoice if you're thinking about what's being said. If you're not saved, I pray that it will consider, cause you to consider Jesus Christ and how much he loved you and God sending his son and the great sacrifice that was made so that you can be saved. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. I love verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, look at those last four words, Christ died for us. Heavenly Father, open our hearts, Lord, as we open the Bible. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, please. Minister to that one, dear Lord, that uh, has come here today without Christ. I know what it is to walk into a Baptist church lost. I know what it is to hear the gospel message and to feel the conviction of your Holy Spirit. Thank God that I know what it is to walk an aisle, kneel down with the preacher and have a Bible open. And, and I know what it is to receive you as my Savior. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that's not saved, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. And for the rest of us, Lord... Oh, Lord, we're so prone to take for granted the greatest thing that was ever gifted us. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I recently visited an online site where the host of that site was looking for a very specific type of testimony. The type of testimony he requested was an unusual one. The personal stories he was, he was seeking were stories of near-death experiences, but wait a minute, here's the twist. He was searching for people whose lives were almost lost, but were saved because someone had died for them. Now think about that. That's right. Someone else had given his or her life so that they could live. And this site drew these testimonies and people that were willing to share what happened to them. The first story I read was written about an elementary school principal. The principal was supervising the loading of her students onto the buses at the end of the school day. As one of the buses pulled in to pick up the students, they don't know what happened. Some med medical crisis happened to the driver. Instead of hitting the brakes, he hit the gas, jumped the curb, careened towards a small group of children. The principal 
ran between the bus and the students, screaming at them to run, pushing some out of the way. <clears throat> but in doing so, she was struck by the bus and instantly killed. All of the students survived. Think about this. Those children were given a chance to live out their lives because somebody died for them. Another story involved a father and a son who were walking on a frozen canal when the ice broke, sending them both into the freezing water. The father held up his son as he cried for help. Some men were working on a construction site nearby. They didn't have a rope, but they had some electrical cords, and they tied them together and ran to help. The father's using the last of his energies to mightily host his son on, onto the ice, then to tie it around his waist as he's fighting the undercurrent while he's pushing his son. The little boy, now a young man, had submitted the account of his father's sacrifice. He wrote, as I was being dragged to safety, I looked back into my father's eyes. That was the last time I ever saw my dad alive. His father had died so that he could live. Somebody died for him. Another young lady shared the story of, of her mother who died so that she could be born. Her mother was diagnosed with cancer at the halfway point of the pregnancy and the cancer was aggressive and the doctor encouraged her to abort her baby girl so that they could begin aggressive radiation and chemotherapy, but the mother refused to kill her baby and chose instead to postpone cancer treatment until her daughter was safely birthed. Now, three months later, she gave birth to a healthy baby girl, but by then the cancer had spread and was now untreatable. The mother died two months later. The little girl, now a grown woman, wrote on this website, A day does not pass without me thinking of my mother's love for me. I love this statement. She wrote this, I try to live a life worthy of her sacrifice. I try to live a life worthy of her sacrifice. As you can imagine, many of the stories that were on this website were Sto stories that were shared by military men. A soldier who served in Vietnam told the story of his battle buddy who gave his life to save several other men in his platoon. They'd been ambushed by enemy fire and this soldier and four of his friends had taken cover in a ditch. An enemy threw a grenade into the ditch. His best friend fell on the grenade without hesitation. It exploded and he gave his life shielding his friends from certain death. The soldier wrote this, I live because of his sacrifice. How about this? I think of him every day. I was really moved by this story. It was a young man who uh, told the story of his mother who died protecting him during a car accident. This is back in the days where we didn't have the same laws that we have today. This man was now old, but only seven at the time of the event. He was sitting in the front passenger seat of their pickup truck when an oncoming car swerved into their lane at full speed. His mother only had time to throw herself over the body of her boy just as the two vehicles collided. Her mother's, his mother died of injury sustained in the wreck, but the boy was unharmed, saved by the sacrifice of his mother. And I love this. At the end of the story, he wrote this. I am alive because of what she did. I don't want her name to be forgotten. So if you share this story, please say her name. And I'm going to say it because he asked me to. Her name was Jennifer Lee. Here's a boy that didn't want the sacrifice of what his mother did to ever be forgotten and did not want her name to be forgotten. There were probably another 25, 30 stories in this particular article, all stories of someone who had given their life for someone else. And although I was moved by the stories of the heroism and the valor, I was more moved by the impact, think about this, that these sacrifices had on those whose lives had been spared. Imagine living the rest of your life understanding that someone else had been willing to die for you. Come on, how would that change your view of life? How would that change the way you lived your life? What would you do so that your life showed an appreciation for that level of sacrifice? Well, I want us to spend our time this morning being reminded of the fact that every single one of us could go to that website and post a story. Because everybody in this room, let me say this, somebody died for you. Somebody gave his life so that you could live. And that somebody wasn't just anybody. I appreciate the love of a school principal. I appreciate the heights of a father's sacrifice and the depths of a mother's love. And 
I appreciate the ultimate sacrifice of hundreds of thousands of sailors and soldiers and who have died so that we can enjoy our freedom, but the one who died for me loved me with a special love, a sinless love. He loved me with a perfect love. He loved me with a supernatural love. His love did not just alter my, my life here on earth, but it literally changed the course of eternity for me forever. His death opened heaven's gates for me, and it opened heaven's gates for you. And by the way, his name should not be forgotten either. His name should be spoken out loud. Come on, whenever we tell the story, we should tell his name. Think about this. The amen was silent so that I could be saved. The branch was broken so that I could be grafted in. The shepherd was smitten so that the sheep could be spared. The cornerstone was disallowed so that a mansion could be built for me. The creator died for his creation. The door was unhinged so that I could enter in. The first became last. The king became a convicted criminal. The lawgiver was pronounced guilty. Life became death. The sinless one became sin. The morning star fell. The lamb was impaled. The Lord of glory became the man of sorrows. The sun set, the light was extinguished, the Almighty became the all-willing, and He did it for me, and He did it for you. I know this is simple, but have we forgotten that somebody died for us? Somebody died for us, and His name is Jesus. Sing His name. Come on, say His name. Shout His name. Proclaim His name. Jesus died for you. Never get over it. And never let the story die. Years ago during Bible college days, on weekends, I used to go to inner city Chicago and I worked the bus ministry there, bringing families into church, signing up children, doing the same thing that you all do up here in Alaska. One Sunday I signed up a little six-year-old girl by the name of Ludie. She'd never been to church. And by the way, from the time I met her the first time till I got her mom to give me permission was about six months. And I don't blame a mother for being careful and cautious, sending a little six-year-old girl to, some, to church somewhere uh, with someone that she did not know. But me and the lady workers on the route built a relationship, and finally Ludy came. And boy, you know what it is, when, what it is to have that first-time visitor, and man, her mom was already nervous about sending her, and you want to make sure everything goes right, so I made sure she sat the front seat on the bus and assigned a lady worker to make sure you take her to her Sunday school classroom and tell the Sunday school classroom she teach her you need to walk her to children's church and let's not lose this girl, you know. Let's make sure this is a good experience for her. So in between Sunday school and church, I look and her teacher had left the room and she had a little rope. And that's how she helped get the little children from one class to the another. They'd all hold on to the rope. And, and so I, I looked over and I saw Ludie and I was... Uh, 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 on, in the parking lot. She was walking through the parking lot and all of a sudden she saw me and she let go of the rope and she went running towards me and all of a sudden halfway there she burst into tears and oh my goodness sakes, I'm thinking to myself, what in the world has happened? Somebody's been mean to her. Somebody bullied her. What's the problem here? I'm never going to get her to come back. So I rushed over to where she was. I got down to where I could look her in the eye and she just sat there and sobbed, and finally I said, Ludie, what's going on? And I'll never forget what she said. She'd never been to church. Never heard the story of Jesus before. They taught on the, on the crucifixion in the Sunday school class. And she kept crying, and she finally looked at me, and she blurted out, why did he let them do that? Why did they do that to him? The teacher said he could have stopped them. Why would they kill him like that? Why did Jesus die? Boy, every once in a while you have those moments where it just seems like God put everything together. And by the way, if you are one that thinks that children can't be saved, you need to get into your King James Holy Bible. Jesus didn't tell, you know what? He didn't tell children that they need to become more adult-like in order to be saved. He told adults, you better become like a little child if you want to be saved. And thank God for the purity of the faith of children and their willingness to put their whole hearts into what they believe. And I got to be able to sit on a curb. I waved over to the Sunday school teacher and said, I'll bring her to Children's Church and be able to sit on the curb and open a King James Holy Bible and show her why Jesus did what he did. But when she asked that question, I began to think to myself, you know what? 
I guess I know why, but I'll never understand it. I really never understand what, what God saw in all of us that would cause him to want to send his son to die on the cross for us. It's a mystery to me because I know Jerry Ross and I knew, know who I am and I know what I am. And the fact that God looked down and loved me enough to send his son to die on the cross, I, I've never quite gotten over it. Can we answer the question this morning that Ludie asked? Why did he do it? Why did he let it happen? Why did Jesus die for you? Number one, let me say this. Somebody died for you to save you from your sins. Look, if you will, back in verse number six there. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why did Jesus die? He died for us. He died for my sins. You see, the wages of sin is death. And you know what? Jesus Christ was willing to come down and say, I will pay for the sins of all mankind. I should have had to pay for those sins. He paid for them for me. I mentioned in Sunday school the people here that my dad was in the ministry for 41 years and they assumed that I was born into a Christian home. I wasn't born into a Christian home. My mom and dad were lost, unchurched. And uh, at five years of age was the first time I ever walked into a church. My dad had taken a job, moved from Greencastle, Indiana to Brazil, Indiana, work at Anaconda Aluminum Company, and he bought a little mini farm north of Brazil, 24 acres, kind of a dream place, something he'd always wanted. And, and you know what? New job, new Buick, 1966, Buick Special Station Wagon, red, beautiful. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know what? Young family, new place. And yet, come on, look right up here, something missing. Something missing. I mean, you can fill your life with everything you want to fill it with. You can make all the money you want to make, and you can do everything that the world will say is going to make you happy. But you know what? There was always something missing in my mom and dad's heart. And you know what? Finally, we had next-door neighbors, and I told the story of how Jerry and Ruth Purcell began to invite us to church. And my mom and dad didn't come the first time, the second time. But you know what, eventually, eventually they came to church. And uh, my dad began to attend a revival meeting held at that church. He told my mom on the way home when he got invited to revival meeting. I mean, they'd just been coming Sunday mornings. And he told my mom, he said, uh, they, this week they're going to have revival. And they, they were unchurched, no church background. My mom says, what's a revival? He's like, you're not going to believe it. Well, what is it? These people go to church on Monday night and Tuesday night and Wednesday night and Thursday night and Friday night. I remember my mom saying, you did not tell them we're going to come. And my mom said, my dad said, I told them we'd come the first night, Monday night, that's it. And she's like, Monday night in church, I don't even know. And so we went to church on Monday night. And God began to work in my daddy's heart. He came home from work on Tuesday and said, get ready. And we all looked around. We're going to church. I thought, we're going to church. We went to church on Tuesday night. Wednesday, we went to church. Thursday, we went to church. My dad said this later. We didn't know what God was doing in my dad's heart, but Thursday, after the revival meeting, as he was walking to the car in the parking lot there, he told God, Lord, I should have went forward and got saved. If you let me live until tomorrow night, I'll go forward and get saved. And God was gracious and merciful to my dad, extended his grace another day, and my dad, on the first note of the invitation on a Friday night, last night of revival meeting, hey, this is why I'm saying, folks, don't give up on your neighbors. Uh, well, I've invited them, and they said no. We'll invite them again. But they're going to get mad. Well, my mom slammed the door in Jerry Purcell's face, and then two weeks later we were sitting in church, so just keep going. You don't know. You don't know. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to scare them away. Well, where are you going to scare them to? Hell number two, three? What are we doing? I think we talk ourselves out of stuff that Jesus Christ would have just went ahead and done. Amen? And so we, my dad went down the aisle, and you ought to have seen all of us kids looking and Mama looking, where's he going? And my, this wasn't my dad. He was an introvert. We sat way in the back, hardly talked to anybody. And, and you know what? He came to, he went to the aisle and got, uh, went to the altar and got saved. And, and you know what? My mom didn't get saved the next week, but you know what? About a month later, she received Christ. Then my older sister received Christ. Well, at least she says she received Christ. I mean, I don't know if any older sister can really be saved. I think of all the things she did to me all through the years. Can I get an amen somewhere, all right, there? And uh, 
But she, she professes Christ as her Savior. My older brother got saved. And aren't you glad that God tenderly works in the heart of children? And I didn't get saved for a long time. But you know what's interesting? If you just keep those babies in church, come on. I just end up being my fifth year, turning six years of age. But you know what? Thank God for you Sunday school teachers. Thank God for children's church. And these people that are gifted, Brother McGovern, to be able to take the complexities of the Word of God and take it down. My daddy called it putting the jelly on the bottom shelf so everybody could reach it. And you know what? I remember hearing about hell and boy, it scared me in heaven. And I thought, could there be such a wondrous place? And I mean, the preacher preached on sin. Hey, let's get back to preaching on sin. Amen. Because every one of us need to feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit when it comes to the sinfulness of our life, the hopelessness without Christ. And it didn't all come together overnight, but thank God a little here and a little there. And I love that little phrase in the Bible where it says, the light of the glorious gospel shone in. And you know what? There was a story told by our pastor's wife. She used to, she used to herd all of us into the back room during the Bible study time. And she told a little story. And I remember she had a little picture book and she told the story of a, a Chinese twins, two young men that were twins and a missionary that had gone to China and tried to reach this family for the Lord Jesus Christ. Got these two boys to come to church. One of them walked the aisle and got saved. The other one walked out and said, I'll never be back. And boy, talk about ch choosing two different paths. The Christian brother, boy, he got, went hard after God and went to church, was faithful, and really got a burden for his brother. And the other brother got into all kinds of terrible things involved in gangs and criminal activity and but his saved brother, identical twin, saved brother, never lost a burden for his, see his brother come to Christ. And I'm sitting there as a little boy, and she's showing these pictures. And you got to understand, man, when you're five, about six years, you're all in on this, you know. And all of a sudden, she turned the picture, and it showed the, 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 the saved boy at home. And he's listening. He's got the door open. And he's listening. And, and he, can, he can hear sirens coming, the police coming. And boy, as he's looking out, all of a sudden, here comes his brother across the yard and he comes busting into the house and he's got blood all over his shirt and he takes his shirt off and he's trying to figure ask him what happened what happened and, and you know what he's got blood all over his shirt and he uh he takes the shirt off and throws it on the ground grabs grabs a clean shirt runs out the back door and all of a sudden that saved brother realizes you know what he's done something he's killed somebody they will execute him by the way we're talking about china folks we're not talking about due process we're not talking about setting on death row for 15 years. If they catch you and they feel like the, uh, that you did it, they just take care of business over there. And uh, all of a sudden she turned the page and there's that Christian brother picking up that shirt with the blood on it and he's putting it on, taking his white shirt off. Come on now. A little child can understand this. Putting on a shirt that had blood on it and he's standing out in the front yard like this and they arrest him and take him and that night there's a positive identification made. Identical twins. And, with, and he doesn't open his mouth. And they execute him. His brother's in hiding for a day or two. Finally, news gets to him. He hears what his Christian brother did. He heads right to the police station. He walks in and said, you got the wrong one. You got the wrong one. He didn't do anything. And they looked at him and said, that crime's already been paid for and that case is already closed. And I'm sitting there as a little boy, and I watch her turn the page, and there's Jesus hanging on a cross. And I thought to myself, he did it for me. He did it for me. So many people know that Jesus died. They see the little crosses, you know, that the Catholics wear. Or the, they, they, they know he died. They see the pictures hanging up in a church somewhere. They know he died, but it never gets past that. Somebody died for you. Somebody died for you. Somebody died for you. Boy, the next Sunday morning, I slept on that for a couple nights from Wednesday to Sunday. Next Sunday morning, I'm tugging on my daddy's coattail during the invitation with tears running down my eyes. I said, Dad, I need to get saved. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to say, first of all, somebody died for you to save you from your sins. And the greatest day of my life was the day that I realized that he did that for me. And that it's possible for me to have my sins forgiven, my name written down in the Lamb's book of life, and to be eternally secure, not because of who I am or what I did, but because of what He did for me. 
So number one, somebody died for you to save you from your sins. Number two, somebody died from you, died for you, and this is what us, us as Christians need to get back to. Listen, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with any of us that can't be fixed at Calvary. I became convinced of that years ago. Anytime there's something wrong in Jerry Ross, if I go back to Calvary, there's, there's something there that fixes it. Somebody died for you to save you from your sins. Somebody died for you to save you from yourself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read these words. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Listen to this. And that he died for all. Why? Why did he die? That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So somebody died for you to save you from your sins, but folks, somebody died for you to save you from yourself. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The Bible doctrine of the substitutionary atonement should forever alter our lives. Christ did not die for your sins so that you could get saved and live for yourself. Folks, listen to me. This is King James Holy Bible. Seems like so many people want just enough Jesus to escape hell. But that's not the only reason he died. He didn't just die for us to save us from our sins. He died for us to save us from ourselves. He died to save you from the doom and the dread of living a sorry and, and satanic life of sinful selfishness. A man in my church asked me a question several years ago. He said, uh, Preacher, do you know what the fastest growing religion in it? in America is today, and I didn't know what it was, and I said, I don't know, have you researched it? He said, no, I just thought of that. I said, well, why don't you look, and I'll look, and so, you know what, when you don't know anything or want to find out something, what do you do? You Google it, I guess. If it's on the internet, it's got to be true. And the man, so well, we, we both went and came back and talked about it. I, I got on the internet, and all I my search produced was a list of confusing statistics and authoritative claims Believe it or not, the Mormons claim it's Mormonism. Shock, shock. Jehovah Witnesses argue for themselves. By the way, most statistics point to Islam, although several articles touted the number one new belief. Listen, the number one new belief is unbelief, given the title to atheism. Isn't that sad? So after I got done, I still wasn't sure I had a definitive answer. And all of a sudden, I kind of pushed back away from my computer, and I leaned back, and I was talking to the Lord, and he said, you know what the fastest growing religion is. I said, Lord, I don't. He said, yes, you do, if you'd think. 60 years of my life being a Christian, almost 40 years of ministry experience, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke it clear to me, and he's right. I can tell you exactly what the fastest growing religion is. And by the way, there's not even a close second. The fastest growing religion in America is the religion of self-worship. The religion of self-worship. By the way, why should we be shocked? Didn't the Bible prophesy, predict it was so, be so? 2 Timothy 3, this also know that in the last days perilous times shall come. What is the first sin that's listed? By the way, I believe all the other sins stem through this first one. For men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves. Now think about that. Think about that. In the last days, the sin that's not only going to permeate the world, but permeate the church of Jesus Christ is that we're going to be involved in this idea of worshiping ourselves or loving ourselves supremely above anything and everything. And by the way, why should that surprise us that that's the devil's attack plan? If we listen to Jesus, when he was asked the question, think about this, Master, what is the, the great commandment the law? Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt, now what, think about it, thou shalt what? Love the Lord thy God. With all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt lay, love thy neighbor as thyself. So if you ask Jesus, he said, here's the two greatest commandments. You love God supremely above anybody and everything else with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength. And you love your neighbors yourself. Now think about this. What has the world promoted? What has the devil promoted? Come on, church, have we bought into it? Today, self-love has mutated into self-worship. This reprobate society has fulfilled the prophecy found in Romans chapter 1, and we now worship and serve the creature more than the creator. 
Many of you would know the name of Whitney Houston, multi-platinum American singer. She notched a mega hit when she sang a song entitled The Greatest Love of All. And by the way, you know where Whitney Houston learned to sing? In a Baptist church, in the choir. You know where she sang her first solo? In a Baptist church. Think about that. So you think somebody raised in a Baptist church who's a who was raised underneath the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, if she was going to sing a song entitled The Greatest Love of All, wouldn't it be a song about Jesus? Wouldn't it be a song about what God has done for each and every one of us? But no, that's not it. Here's the words to that song. Because the greatest love of all is happening to me, I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Listen. Learning to love yourself, it is the greatest love of all. By the way, folks, you've got to be careful that secular humanism has not snuck into your family. You know, it's interesting that Jesus said, if you want to be one of my disciples, here's the requirements. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And yet you preach that even into good churches and more and more of the congregation turns their head and stares at you and looks a little funny. It's almost like we have been affected by this idea that we are more important than anything. And we're not. We, should, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and all of our souls. And by the way, why should we love Him? And Where do we learn to love Him? We love Him because He first loved us. How do we know that? Because of what Jesus did on Calvary's cross. By the way, let's get back to... Whitney Houston, did this self-love philosophy of life translate into a personal life of happiness and joy? Although we cannot know all that was in her heart, her life tells a story. Her public fame did not keep her from private life of drug abuse. February 11, 2012, February 11, 2012, Whitney Houston was found unconscious in her suite at the Beverly Hilton Hotel, submerged in her bathtub, the lost... Angeles County Coroner's Office later reported that Houston's death was caused by drowning and the effects of heart disease and cocaine use. Listen to me, she was only 48 years of age. I pray that she was saved, Brother McGovern. I hope that she was. I hope in that little Baptist church she received Jesus Christ as her Savior. I got online because I was curious and I listened to an interview that she had with, with um, Oprah. And you know what? Oprah asked her at at the end of this, as she was trying to overcome the drugs and coming out of a bad marriage, she said, do you find peace anywhere? And she said, the only time I find peace is early in the morning, if I can get up as the sun's coming out, and I get my Bible, and I go back, and I sit on my balcony, and I read the Bible and talk to the Lord. That's the only moments of peace I know. And I thought to myself, that little girl in that Baptist church, come on, young people, you're going to have to choose a direction. Just because you're raised in a Christian home, you're, you have a free will. You can have the best Christian parents and be in the best church, but you know what? You're going to have to decide. Are you going to live a life that declares to God and everyone else, I love me? Or are you going to live a life that's worthy of the sacrifice that someone made? Somebody died for you. In this simple, but we need to get back to it. Somebody died for you. Somebody died for you. Self-love has been so promoted and defended in our society, so ingrained into our psyche that even Christians, we recoil at the notion of self-denial. And yet, we need Christian young people to say, I'm not going to love myself, I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. How about this? Lord, give me the hard thing to do. I'll be willing to do for anything for you because of what you did for me. Yes, somebody died for us to save us from ourselves. Andrew Murray said, a true revival means nothing less than a revolution. Casting out the spirit of worldliness and selfishness and making God and his love triumph in the heart and life. Thomas Kempis wrote, let this be thy whole endeavor, this thy prayer, this thy desire, that thou mayest be stripped of all selfishness and with entire simplicity, follow Jesus only. If I was at home this weekend, I would have got up several year, uh, hours ago and stood in front of our children in our opening assembly and let them in the children's courses before we turn them loose 
And one of the songs that I lead him in every single Sunday morning, every one without fail, Jesus and others and you, what a wonderful way to spell joy, Jesus and others and you in the life of each girl and each boy, and then I'll go like this and they'll all hold the finger up. J is for Jesus, for what? He has first place. O is for others, you meet face to face. Y is for you and whatever you do, so put yourself third and spell joy. I don't know who the most selfish person in the room is today, but I can tell you this. You're also the most miserable person in the room today. Because no true happiness has never been, ever been found worshiping at the altar of you. But the happiest people in the room today are those that will say, I'll live a life reflective of my appreciation and recognition. A life worthy of the level of sacrifice that Jesus gave in order for me to have eternal life. Somebody died for you so that you can be saved. Somebody died for you to save you from yourself and in closing. Somebody died for you so that you have a story to tell. And aren't you glad, folks, that we could go to that website today and we could log in and say, you know what, I got a story to tell. Because, yes, I almost died. Matter of fact, I was dead in trespasses and sins. But somebody came down and died on the cross for my sins. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know what? All they did was create the website and people flooded for an opportunity to tell their story. And folks, as we leave here and go into another work-a-day work, work week, we ought to be looking for opportunities to tell the story. Here's a great way to start the conversation. Hey, do you got a couple minutes where I can tell you about the greatest thing that ever happened to me? And you know what? I say that often. Almost never am I refused the opportunity. And if we lived as if that truly was the greatest thing that ever happened to us, God would give us those opportunities. Vacation Bible School, brother. I love Vacation Bible School. You know what? We have it the very first week in June every year. You know why I do that? So as I drive through the community the rest of the summer and I see people with VBS this week on their sign, I laugh and say, thank God ours is already over and those people still have to do there. So that's why I was smiling out there during your VBS announcement. You know what? There's opportunities to tell. Why do you go to, v why have VBS? Why, why come to Saturday? Why pass out these flyers? Listen, I, I don't know. It seems like we, we have young people today and I'm, I'm not throwing you all in the same boat. Seems like they're in my office about once a month needing a new reason to live for God. A new reason not to quit. A new reason to stay on their bus route or a new reason to stick with that junior church. Brother, I learned this reason when I was five years old. Somebody died for me. I've never needed another one. That took me from the beginning and it's going to take me all the way to the finish line. And listen, if that's not a good enough reason to do what we do, then we might as well quit. Because somebody died for us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.